Thanks, uh, Joanne, for that welcome. And I have to say, I'm delighted to be here at your 2015 annual conference. Um, we are a matter of weeks away, maybe even days away, from arguably the most profound political reform of UK pensions, um, certainly that we've seen since Beveridge in the 1940s. Um, the policy and business leaders, and all of us here today, um, it, it's a pretty critical period of change. And I know that some people will define our professional lives or see the changes as defining our professional lives over the coming years. Um, but it's not just change. Um, we're also facing a period of, frankly, uncharted territory, not just for the domestic pension industry or for regulators or politicians or suppliers of products, but, but actually quite critically for those individuals who are approaching retirement. They'll have a very different pension journey, a very different experience from that of their parents. Certainly more choice, certainly more flexibility, but also potentially far more significant decisions to take. So there is understandably an element of unpredictability here over what the future holds. And here we're talking about the short term future. For some, we're on the threshold of a significant opportunity. For others, only risk. But the reality for those who are at the center of this stage, in particular for many of you, for many firms, for policymakers, is that we've moved well beyond the point, the Socratic debating point of this change over what direction to take. What matters now is very simply one thing, it's delivery. Delivery, delivery of the vision, delivery of practical implementation of a significant change and delivery of how effectively the political principles are applied in practice, how well are, support, are consumers supported under the new regime as we move things forward. And importantly, how do we accomplish all of this in the context of an industry that is, like no other, dominated both by past complexity and future uncertainty? So on one hand here, you have customers entering retirement today with policies affected over the course of many years by multiple waves of reform and change, often predating man's landing on the moon. Um, on the other, you have the wider challenges linked to the most complex societal trends and behavioral issues. So policymakers 20 years from now, particularly in countries like the US, like the UK, look likely to be dealing with the effect of a world that appears to struggle to save, or make decisions based on far off events. And of course, we know this in turn will be affected by wider shifts in society, particularly the maturing demographic. So even as we're putting aside less, we're aging more. Fascinatingly, I'm told that we as a population are aging by five hours per day. That's scary. Um, the globally, the forecast here is for a 244% increase in the number of over 85s in the next 35 years. Now, few are predicting that these trends will slow. Indeed, the smart money is on a rapid acceleration in longevity. Many scientists are today confidently predicting that the advent of gyro protector drugs and the like will have a even more profound impact on the aging process than we've seen over the last 40 years. So whether we look to the past, whether we look to the future for context, the conclusion is much the same. We're in the middle, as the ABI argued last month, of one of the defining challenges of our age. And, and for me, one of the particularly interesting questions here, and the one I want to look at specifically this afternoon, is who ultimately has the responsibility for meeting this challenge. Historically, at least, accountability has always rested firmly on the shoulders of leaders, in government, regulation, in industry. But how, if at all, do the new pension freedoms affect all this? Certainly, there's much more pressure on industry today to ensure that policyholders, individuals, receive as much of the returns on their investments as possible. There's also, quite rightly, a broad and quite important responsibility 
here for the regulator, for the FCA, to protect consumers across the arc of adulthood, from first contributions to final pension payment. But of course, one of the most significant features of the new policy landscape is that it's effectively, for most people, a self-selection model, which means it's underpinned by an equation of responsibility that, frankly, we've not seen before, certainly in an area of this complexity. Political responsibility, certainly, as well as industry and policy-making responsibility, but also crucially, and in many respects the defining change, consumer responsibility. So the, this afternoon I want to touch on all three um, and set out how, how they appear to us, how they appear to me. So where does one begin and the next end? What are the opportunities here as well as what are the risks that we all need to manage? So let me start with industry responsibility, which has of course always been a feature of the market, but where the context has evolved quite considerably over the last few years. So if you look at the current pension environment, specifically we're clearly in a different place today than we were say 30 or 40 years ago. These were periods of relatively low employment churn where a pension was seen by employees as an essential and valuable workplace benefit. And this in turn encouraged firms to take a more rigorous, somewhat paternalistic approach, if you like, to managing their pension schemes. So trust-based and defined benefit schemes thrived. What we've got today, by way of contrast, we're in a situation where we've got a significantly more mobile labour force, a greater understanding of longevity, coupled with general society issues over disengagement on pension policy, delayed gratification, and so on. And it means there's generally less pressure applied on firms by their employees for pension benefits. <coughs> so the result is twofold. First, we've seen the transformational shift from DB to DC, and from high employer con contributions to much lower ones. Second, those offering or arranging workplace pensions do not, frankly, live under the same existential threat as their predecessors. There's less pressure to perform from employers. So questions over charges, the basis points difference between 50 basis points or 100 basis points, say, suddenly look far less confronting priorities. Now, this, of course, is a particular worry today because as returns to investments fall, small differences in charge rates become correspondingly more important to the employee's final pension pot, as indeed they should be for those managing these funds. So the first responsibility here, as in fact the NAPF has been working on through its leadership in areas like pension quality mark, is effectively one of good governance. And it's one that rests firmly on the shoulders of pensions firms, contract-based schemes, and occupational scheme trustees. Clearly, the situation you have at the moment, where something like £30 billion of contract and bundled trust-based assets in workplace pensions are estimated to be at risk of poor value for money. And that's unsustainable, though those figures are from a, an OFT study in 2013. Add to this the fact that there's often <clears throat> a lack of a capability here too. So in occupational or employer-organised contract-based schemes, a firm's trustees may be professional engineers, say, or advertising executives, not, not necessarily pension experts. And you quickly run into some very significant concerns over quality standards and how they're consistently applied. So what we have today Effectively, it's this situation where trustees and independence governance committees have now become a core political and regulatory imperative, underpinning much of the broader pension reform work around us, particularly auto-enrolment. Last week, as a fairly recent and topical example, we had a discussion paper published <clears throat> looking at how you could standardise transaction cost disclosure highlighting the opacity of charges facing IGCs and trustees across some 40 individual transaction and uncapped investment fees. On top of this, 
you have FCA rules that place a requirement on firms to both assess and importantly raise concerns about value for money on behalf of scheme members. And then finally, of course, there's been much greater focus on areas like quality of governance, oversight for trustees, with minimum standards coming in. Whilst all workplace pension schemes also have new rules on these consultancy charges, active member discounts, commission, charge caps, and so on. So a great deal of activity, a, a lot of moving parts. <clears throat> but it is important, again, when I talk about responsibility, it's an imperative for the industry to positively engage on both the spirit and the letter of these reforms, to treat this fiduciary responsibility with the utmost sincerity, if you like. And, and finally, the FCA will be offering practical support and guidance to IGCs over the coming months, particularly to those who don't have the necessary level of practical technical expertise, to effectively manage funds for their policyholders up to the point where they then use their new freedoms. This brings me on to the second area of responsibility, the core issue of consumer responsibility, the self-selection model, and how people choose to use their pension flexibilities. <clears throat> At the centre of this debate, clearly, many enormously significant questions for society. Indeed, for policy leaders today, these are perhaps the most significant questions faced in a generation. The first, maybe the most pressing, is, is very simply this. What will be the fundamental purpose of workplace pensions from April? Not a question UK policymakers have ever had to confront before due to the nature of annuities. But that's now very immediate. Annuities gave you an income for life. So come April, do we see pensions in the traditional post-beverage context of being there to alleviate poverty in retirement? Or are they now a replacement rate for working age income? Or are they going to be used to clear debt or make property purchases? And how importantly are all these questions themselves <coughs> affected by the societal changes around us? the increasing numbers who've lived and spent their way through the first great age of consumerism, the broad switch from defined benefit to defined contribution, reduced ra savings ratios, higher expectations of living standards, and so on and so forth. These are all profoundly important questions. Certainly under the system as it will be, there will be no ability to prevent all of the people, all of the time, from making suboptimal decisions. Some savers come 55 will invariably buy their Lamborghini or head to Las Vegas or otherwise calculate how to run down their pension pots over the short term rather than over many years. Optimists among us, I hope, will be inclined to believe that these numbers will be fractional. Pessimists may think that they're much more significant I was struck by uh, a short comment I saw in the press uh, a couple of weeks ago that um, Saga were predicting that their cruise bookings would increase by 8% from April. But the reality is, <clears throat> this is all simply part of the process that flows from the benefits of freedom. Some responsibility, by definition, has to bump across from industry to customers. Otherwise, you simply return to frankly, difficult conversations around why policymakers should, in effect, decide how savers draw their money. The challenge here, however, is one of degree. So to what extent does that responsibility bump across? And is it perfectly reasonable, I think it is perfectly reasonable, I think, for firms to question where accountability eventually lies? If you end up in a situation where, say, X or Y percentage of consumers refuse to listen to the guidance or risk warnings or even, dare I say, advice, um, and refuse to listen to those and take very short-term decisions, who ultimately to, is to blame if 15, <clears throat> 10 years from now, those people regret whatever choice they've made or complain that they weren't properly guided? And, and actually, at that point, it becomes very difficult to sensibly argue that individual consumers 
shouldn't accept responsibility, nor, I think, would wider society expect otherwise. But there are still wider issues for policymakers over what all this means in terms of provision. Do trustees want to provide the flexibilities? Will advisors and providers want to take the regulatory risk that they see, and so on and so forth. So understandably, as we approach April, there is some industry anxiety here, particularly over issues like liability and how far providers need to go to warn consumers or prevent them from making choices that they believe are against the consumer's best interest. And, and that's where the policy-making responsibility kicks it back in for the regulator. So I've talked about responsibility for providers, I've talked about responsibility for consumers. <clears throat> what are the responsibilities for the regulator, for the FCA? What we have done, we've issued important guidance on where liability begins and ends for providers. But the core challenge here, of course, is the successful delivery of the guidance guarantee, along with retirement risk warnings. Now, the FCA role here is, is very carefully set out, but it's important because it effectively underpins all of today's pension reforms, with an infrastructure of protections and support that follow savers from the minute that they enter the workplace to the moment they begin to consider what they do with their pension. So on the one hand, there is FCA industry focus on areas like standards, <clears throat> like conduct. On the other, significant support for consumers through areas like the charge cap, risk warnings, disclosure, and so on. So those who draw out their pensions under the new freedoms will be in a position to make what are clearly life-influencing decisions on future income with some confidence that the structure behind their choice is sound. And it's worth reflecting here that there is strict delineation of responsibility between agencies. So on the one hand, you will have effectively the FCA setting the standards, monitoring compliance, and <clears throat> very importantly, collecting the levy to fund provision of the guidance service. It will not, however, regulate the provision of pension-wise. HMT, which has overall accountability for delivering the pensions guidance service, including deciding the broad approach, setting aims, and acting on recommendations from the FCA. So come April the 6th, what you will have is a structure under which customers will, on seeking access to their pensions, immediately be recommended, be told to go and get guidance, use the service, go to PensionWise, get the level of financial guidance that is available to you. After which, when a decision is made, the system will effectively have a further check, if necessary, triggering a personalised risk warning. <clears throat> so allowing another opportunity for people to assess the wisdom of their choice. Effectively, then, what we're describing is a division of responsibility between consumers, firms and policymakers, which is quite a long way from today's annuity-based system, all of which presents significant opportunities for sure, and certainly it looks as though there is appetite here amongst policyholders to use their new freedoms. While interestingly, we're already beginning to see firms, including some of the newer online investment platforms, starting to advertise in this space. But as yesterday's Work and Pensions Committee report laid out, <clears throat> we deceive ourselves if we imagine that there are not also risks for firms and policymakers to manage in this change process. One of the, one of the most important for me, uh, the possibility that some customers in the first tranche to benefit from the new freedoms will be targeted by criminal acts, by fraud, by the sort of scams that unfortunately we see all too often where money is at stake, and particularly where there's a, a greater degree of uncertainty. And this will be, let's be clear, I'd be under no illusion, the moment of maximum uncertainty. So for the pension industry, the upcoming switch in regime looks something akin to a Y2K moment, 
particularly given that there will be a significant number of people who've held off crystallizing their pensions over the last year in order to take advantage of the new policy landscape. It is an imperative that this risk is properly managed and mitigated. Otherwise, you enter what's clearly <coughs> very difficult territory. Policyholders, for example, being enticed to invest in scams by higher returns, guaranteed higher returns, in a low-risk environment, or indeed that the possibility that firms target consumers before they hit 55 with pension liberation scams, persuading them to access their money before the rules allow access. A particular risk, um, given that many of those approaching retirement today will, unlike their parents' generation, be carrying debts with them. So clearly some pretty important challenges to manage, but whether you believe in freedom of choice, public paternalism, or in some combination of the two, the presence of risk is frankly unavoidable. It exists now, it will accelerate as we move towards April the 6th. And, and certainly there's no appetite at either end of the political spectrum for the context to remain as it is today. So let me conclude. The great unknown is of course what April and the years ahead will bring for all of us? What choices will customers make? Will the annuity market be as affected as some are predicting? Or will it, as others argue, still hold an attraction for policyholders as a replacement rate? And for firms on a more prosaic but quite important level, how effectively will the challenge of preparing for the new regime be in terms of core areas like IT, upgrades, communications. What we don't know, frankly, is how consumers will respond from April the 6th. Will we face the great yawn? I think as Steve Webb suggested we might of people staying in bed. Will we face an M25 moment where we see suddenly um, a huge demand in a huge upshift in traffic to use a new service that's available? Will we see a Heathrow Terminal 5 moment where actually, no matter how good the design in the background is, things just don't work on the day. None of us know. But what we do know is that we've created a model where the responsibilities have shifted. There is more consumer responsibility. Consumers are being given greater freedom and greater choice. And as many protections as we can build collectively from the regulator, from regulated firms, ultimately, it's a consumer decision as to what choice they make at that point in time. And again, this comes back to the point I made at the beginning. That's why it's the defining moment of our age. Thank you very much.